back, guys, to the JPS podcast. And in this episode, I'm very honored to have Ben Esgro. And Ben is the Chief Operating Officer at Denova Nutrition. He's currently studying pharmaceutical chemistry and has a sports and exercise science degree, as well as a nutrition and dietetics degree. Amongst this, he's also a coach, powerlifter, and bodybuilder, and a consultant for many physique athletes. In this episode, we discuss the science of supplements and cover many topics related to the research, production, manufacturing, and the distribution of supplements. Topics such as what makes a supplement effective, how long it takes for supplements to come to life from the lab to the consumer, the regulation of supplements, and DeNovo's experience in being regulated or the lack of regulation, how athletes and coaches can be more savvy with their supplementation, what supplements are indeed effective, and some unconventional compounds on the horizon, DeNovo's philosophy when it comes to supplementation, as well as some the- philosophical chats around how how to continue discovery and improvement, not just in the realms of supplementation, but as a fitness professional. So for the first time ever, I have timestamps so you can navigate as you need throughout this episode, but I hope you guys enjoy this. And without further ado, I present you Ben Esgro. So guys, welcome back to the JPS podcast, and I'm very honored to have Ben Esgro. Ben, welcome, man. Thank you for having me. And on this episode, guys, we're going to be talking about the science of supplements. So for those of you who don't know, Ben is the Chief Operating Officer at DeNovo Nutrition who make a number of supplements and he's very hands-on with the production of their supplements and everything along those lines. And he's currently studying uh, pharmaceutical chemistry. So he's a very, very intelligent dude and somebody who I highly respect in this regard. So first, Ben, do you want to talk to the listeners about the broad strokes and the role of supplements for strength and physique athletes? Sure. Um, I I guess I'd start by saying that I I think supplements are a pretty polarizing topic. Um, Some people, I think especially when you get into academics, which have now infiltrated a lot of fitness, for for the better. I don't have a problem with that at all. I think if I did, I'd be a hypocrite. Um, But... I think a lot of of the more academic type blatantly kind of label or disregard supplements as as being ineffective or you know uh, that you don't need them or and, and that's true they're called supplements for a reason they're not called essentials. Um, however, I think to broadly say that these compounds that have been around alongside humans pretty much for our existence on 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 the planet. And we've been using them for, you know, three, five or more thousand years. Uh, and they've stayed with us and they've, they've continuously been applied for these purposes. I think to say that, that they're useless or that there's nothing there is, uh, is a little bit overlooking. Um, and I, I started as a supplement junkie, uh, and believing everything that, companies marketed and said, and this was when I was an undergrad, early twenties, really, you know, going hard into bodybuilding. And I did find something there. And I think it, it, it has continued to kind of breadcrumb me in a path where, um, I get more and more evidence that there's definitely something there. And while sometimes subtle, it can lead to some pretty dramatic things. Um, and I guess my, my end case for that will be, because it's, it's now a pretty hot topic, um, just look at something like Kratom. Uh, that is a pretty popular supplement right now that a lot of people are using, and now they're just starting to study it in pharmacology labs. Uh, and they're finding that it has an impressive balance of effects on multiple different neurotransmitter systems um, that we are now medicating people with like, like opioid, opioid drugs and stuff that's killing people and not helping them and getting them addicted. It's doing it in a more gentle and soft manner. Um, which now is probably going to be regulated as, as a drug, ironically, because it competes with, you know, with drug companies. However, I'll, <laughs> I don't want to ruin the interview. There's, I know there's more to talk about, but my point is 
that there's a lot that nature does. Uh, um, and I think to disregard it as just, well, it's not, you know, a nutrient, so to speak, then it's useless. I, I think, I think that's just wrong. Yeah. Awesome. And I guess, uh, moving from there, we know that some of these compounds, you know, work and are efficacious with a higher degree of certainty, uh, but some are not. Can you outline, I guess, from a scientific standpoint, how does the science determine what is effective, what isn't effective? And I guess for the listeners who just might not be aware of how you guys in the labs are determining what will have you know, a positive impact on somebody's strength, physique, and so on and so forth, their mental well-being, all the rest of it, um, what is going to lead them to uh, the assumption or belief that X supplement is indeed effective? Sure. Um, I think the difficulty is since, you know, a lot of our connection and I'm sure your audience is, is in fitness, I think we have this habit of deeming anything that maybe doesn't affect physical performance or body comp um, as maybe, I don't know if I'd say useless, but, but not, not as relevant to use as a supplement. And I think my time now go, going a little bit outside of fitness in, into this, uh, into pharmacology and, and pharmaceutical chem has, has taught me and kind of humbled me that uh, neurophysiology and a lot of things beyond that, beyond what you typically would associate with the gym, um, can profoundly affect not just productivity, but also uh, things in the gym. So... Uh, I'll get to the question. Just let me do it in my roundabout way. (laughs) Um, And so I think if you have the habit of just looking at direct studies on, let's say, citrulline malate on exercise performance or creatine monohydrate on strength and power performance, um, those are going to be the traditional ways of determining whether a supplement is, is effective as a dietary supplement for fitness. Um, however, when you go into more broad things, things that affect neurotransmitters, things that affect uh, things much beyond just the fitness industry, it does, I think, partly become more subtle and you have to look at other models because it hasn't gotten to, mm. to uh, the research hasn't gotten there yet, um, which again, I'm just going to use Kratom as a classical example, is oftentimes it becomes experimental, like people have used it or they do continue to use it and the research hasn't quite caught up. Um, so there isn't always the research and that and in, in that point, you're left with a few things. Self-experimentation, which is really the heart of de novo in product development and that starts with me and then goes to a small pilot group and then if I see the continued effect, it branches outward. Um, You have to look at in vitro studies, those are really not going to, so in vitro is in cell culture, Mm -hmm. um, not in a living organism. And you have to look at those and I think if if that's the most you have, I don't know that that's quite a supplement that's ready for the market yet, but you can definitely develop leads from that. And that's what drug companies do, is they'll test something in vitro and they'll see how impactful it is and then they'll do an array of other assays of, of tests and then modify the compound and structure and make a drug out of it. Hopefully if it continues to work, um, I'm not in the place to do that. Uh, cause if I was, I'd be working at a pharma company, not a supplement company. However, um, then you can look at animal models. So rat, mouse, um, other mammals, and you can start to develop this picture of not just does it work, what does it do, mm. but what's its, what's its mechanism. So there's two variables uh, that are studied in pharmacology. One's called pharmacokinetics, one's called pharmacodynamics. Pharmacokinetics is how a drug is absorbed, distributed, metabolized, excreted. So that's going to tell you like the half-life of a drug, its toxicity, uh, important things that you need to know. Pharmacodynamics tells you what exactly inside your body that compound is interacting with to produce its effects. So that would be something like if you take epinephrine, it's a beta agonist. Um, So it's going to increase heart rate and stuff like that. So it 
interacts with adrenergic receptors. So I know I kind of went pretty broad with that, but, but the point is if you look at all of that stuff, you can start to develop this picture of all these options you can utilize because there's not just caffeine then mm. at your, at your, uh, in your toolbox. If you can look through the data of pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, you can either find something that hasn't been used yet or maybe misused for a certain purpose, or you can combine things that have synergy because one thing can work on this receptor somewhat potent, and then another thing can work a little more potent, or it can work on a different subset of receptors and they work together and you get a more powerful response. So I just kind of described to you like that, that is my process in, in de novo, but it always starts with, it starts with that digging into papers and determining is this mechanistically sound? Is there enough research in mammals for this to be safe to play with? Um, and then uh, playing it out and testing, testing it in small dose escalations. And then if that works, keeping a bank of, okay, that worked. This works on a mechanism that should complement that. And then slowly, one by one, combining things mm. and seeing if I could do something unique with them. Like that's how our most popular product utopia was created is, is just slow grinding of like combining things and, and playing and, and knowing what the end effect I was looking for was and, and going to reach that. Um, my final point on that is what I was going for with that was if you remember, I think a lot of people probably remember one, three dimethamylamine or DMAA. That's one, it's one hell of a stimulant. Yes. And <laughs> that if, if you were, it killed a lot of it, natural bodybuilding dreams. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If you were, if you were around for when the period went before it got taken off the market, um, I think you realize how unique the effect was. And that was a very influential compound for me. Cause I was like, Holy shit. Like this, this is not only does this work, but this is very unique. And I was, looking to recreate that that feeling with something that's never going to be scheduled something that's not going to make people test positive for anything uh you know nothing water band and it and it and it gives elements of those feelings that it did and i think that was the first time where i realized wow i think i realized the power of um of i guess of of knowledge and i, and I kind of just fell into it but it, it gets addicting and it makes yeah. me keep going to school and keep pursuing it because it's like, well, what else can I find out? You know what I mean? Yeah, man, that's fantastic. So it's very much a case of, yeah, having an end, end uh, effect in mind, but then starting from scratch and trying to piece together all the uh, requisite information to make sure that you can get there in the end. And what is the general time frame on that? So you spoke of, you know, you going through this process and, you know, for this supplement to come about and to, have sufficient research and then obviously go through the process of in vitro and then animal models um, and then those you know small uh, pilot and beta testing uh, type groups how long is that process generally and you know what are the time frames that you would expect for something like that to occur so I, I, it's important for me to clarify that I'm not doing the in vitro stuff I wish I was I yeah. wish I could say I was, but I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm kind of piggybacking on, on the research that's out yeah. there um, so for me Development of a product can take anywhere from, I think the shortest period is a year. Uh, like our most recent product that came out, Suppress, it, it was about a year in playing and developing. And then um, it, can, it can go upwards anywhere from, you know, two or more. The reality is like, I don't consider any product done. Uh, it evolves because I learn more. We get more user feedback. And from that user feedback, I can almost fine tune it. It's like I'm turning the dials still, um, but at minimum a year and that there's a lot of factors that go into that. I think one of the biggest things that the consumer at large doesn't understand is how long it takes to confirm that you have things in the right serving size, finding the right scoopers doing the labeling, doing the packaging, like it's, 
I think when a new compound or a new something is found, people think it's going to hit the market immediately. Um, but in a multi-ingredient product, especially if if people if brands aren't taking the time, that's way more concerning than just meeting consumer demand. Um, but it's delayed. It's delayed. And don't get me wrong. I'm, I get very impatient very often throughout the process uh, because I panic that someone found what I found and they're going to beat us, you know, to market. Yeah. No, awesome. And something you mentioned earlier was uh, the regulation of supplements. And obviously we know that it isn't heavily regulated, especially not in Australia. And I know uh, with my very limited knowledge that it's not tightly uh, constrained in the US either. So I just wanted you to share your experiences with producing, uh, you know, certain products um, in terms of regulation, if you've had any uh, you know, struggles or issues or any checks uh, on the work that you're doing? So, um, no, and the, I think the simple answer is no. That's because I'm very cautious in, uh, a, as a startup and a, a brand that, you know, we're not at the level of like a, an optimum nutrition we can't afford something like that. You know what I mean? So we have to be very careful and cautious. And, um, so we've, you know, we're very specific in who we choose to manufacture. Like we've literally flown out and visited with people and cut them off the list if they didn't, even if we were at all skeptical about anything that they were doing. Um, I also have a machine called an FTIR, which the really quick and dirty is it shoots an infrared beam of light through a powder. And from that, it gives you a spectrum, and you can determine what the identity of that compound is from it. It's a very wow. quick analytical um, method. So if I'm buying a new ingredient, before I even send it to our manufacturer, I'm going to test it to make sure that it's not bullshit. Um, and then in a final product, we will send it out for third-party testing too. So there's a lot of neurotic components that go into it. Mm. Um, not, and I think it's largely because I'm coming at it from the consumer still, like yeah. I'm still a consumer. I still, I just use our supplements now almost exclusively. You're some, you're I, some meathead in a lab coat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so I would never want to be guilty of the thing that all the companies were guilty of when I got into the market. Mm. Cause then again, how would I be improving or changing anything? Um, I think the other part is I think I hijack uh, preservation of self, meaning like, um, if I don't want to hurt myself, why don't I use the advantages of that thought line for every consumer at large? You know what I mean? Um, and that's how I look at making a formula as well as like, uh, so anyway, I, I don't want to drift too far away from not answering your question. Um, we haven't had any issues. Um, I'd like to think that's because we are cautious and, uh, the interesting part about the, the industry is you do have a choice you, that you can draw a line, uh, in the sand, so to speak, and approach it in a few different ways. And there's still many brands out there that sell stuff that will make you test positive on a drug test that is scheduled or will be scheduled. Um, but I have never wanted us to be that brand because uh, I think you can do it without without going that route. Um, I think it's a very debatable topic, though, of whether that's a good or a bad thing. The more that stuff gets regulated and pharma gets an influence, because um, I think it's good to have a large peer review like like the FDA. However you can very easily make the argument that many drugs have made it and continue to make it to market that are not safe <laughs> and that are not necessarily for the better for the consumer base. So it's, yeah, it's an interesting debate. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, along the lines of, you know, companies, supplement companies that is doing the wrong thing, I guess another area where, Many supplement companies uh, lead consumers astray is bastardizing the research to support, you know, quite outlandish claims at times, uh, you know, that their supplements uh, can afford. Um, you know, so I guess 
most evidence-based coaches and uh, athletes are very aware of you know the the hyperbole and the you know the dogma that many uh, supplement companies will have. But at the same time, I think we're always looking to be innovative and to you know want to you know take that leap of faith and go maybe this is you know something that can just help us get that extra one or two percent. But how can uh, people stay? A little more savvy with their supplements, I guess. You know, where do they need to read between the lines? Things such as like proprietary blends, all the rest of it. I'll let you uh, go into that. Sure. Um, that is one place I think that the industry has changed for the better. There's a lot more uh, full disclosure labels, and um, I think that's a very important starting point. Is read the label, read everything on the label, read it carefully. Um, before you purchase and after, before you use. Um, I think it is very important to do your due diligence also of research as a consumer. Uh, there's a lot of great databases. Examine is excellent. They do a good job of kind of pooling stuff and presenting the research and, and being pretty unbiased with it. Um, I think if you have at all any background in interpreting um, research papers, PubMed is a phenomenal database. Um, even if not, e even if you go on, you just type in the ingredient and find some studies and look at the results. Mm -hmm. That's still better than just completely being naive and ignorant because you can see then uh, what the research says in, to, in comparison to the marketing claims of the product. Um, I think those things are very important. Um, I think reaching out to professionals. I'm, I always say to people, and this applies here too, um, I'm fairly limited on social media. I'm probably more on Instagram now, but if anybody ever has questions on supplements, I'm not going to drive you towards our stuff. I just like this stuff, and I'm happy to answer questions on ingredients, uh, but I'm not certainly not the only person who can answer supplement questions. Um, so I think there's multiple lines to go through. Uh, but I do think the most important place is to almost, before you make an impulse decision to buy something or buy into the marketing, I think you have to check yourself and question whether you're buying into the emotional appeal uh, or what you want to believe that they're capitalizing on, or is there actually a justified reason that this is thought out, like this, this product is thought out, that there is some research, that they link you, that they openly give it to you. Um, because I think anybody who puts something out should at the very least have the confidence to answer some difficult questions on it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I think that those things are all a good starting point. Uh, and then if, if you really wanted to be crazy about it and do the things that I started doing, you can just buy some of the raws yourself and test them out individually and see. You can usually get them cheaper mm -hmm. and you can see if that what part of all of those things has the effect. I'd like to think that part of my job and the reason DeNovo is successful is that I'm doing that for people so they don't have to go do it themselves. Yeah. But um, I would never discourage someone from self-experimentation to learn because it's it's an immensely potent source of not just knowledge, but confidence in your knowledge. Awesome, man. I, re I really like that. Um, and I guess from there, you know, I, I mentioned how science and the research is, especially around supplements anyway, is always trying to be innovative and coming up with new ways of making things better. And like you said, it's always refining, dialing things in. Um, you know, so how do you balance the constant need to improve and come up with novel ideas or at least better ways to do things without making such a large leap of faith, um, you know, where you get so far away from what actually works uh, that, it, that it does become misleading and somewhat uh, not non-effective essentially? I love that question. Um, I... And I think it's the reason I like it so much is is uh, that's largely the question I have to ask myself every day and every time before we put out something new. Um, and it's the reason that I went back uh, to school um, because I mean I've been formulating 
now for seven years. And originally I just, I had my undergrad in nutrition and then sports nutrition. And the reality is, uh, while those degrees are, are definitely an important base of knowledge for me, none of them really deal directly with, you talk about supplements, but you talk about creatine, branch chains, usually stuff that's just, it's been out, out there already. And you never get into the, the pharmacology of anything. Mm. So I got to this place where I realized that the ceiling was very close on the best I was going to be able to do with that educational background and that I'm going to have to do something if I want to keep innovating. And I think I looked backwards and at the present landscape of things and saw that the best formulas had been or are created by people with chemistry backgrounds. And there's a very distinct reason for that uh, because everything that's going on in your body is chem. Um, and you're dealing with compounds. That, that is chemistry. And pharmacology is how your body processes them. So I, I, I wanted to find something where I can, uh, I guess, maybe raise the ceiling another level, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I think now the shift has been not so much to finding this new groundbreaking ingredient and more so to this refined aspect of um, what have we overlooked that is already out there, uh, what is out there from other cultures like, like Ayurveda, like Chinese medicine, um, and is there anything that actually is coming out or maybe just has been an overlooked paper mm. uh, about you know mechanisms on that stuff? It's been more about, again, like just thinking out interactions and being able to look now because I have the I think the path where I should go to find if these things have an interaction and, and like I talked about before, pharma, pharmacology aspects of it and how they're interacting. And I think the last one is I've, I've gained an appreciation that formulation is not just putting a bunch of stuff either into a pill or a powder and if it works, it's done. Um, I think now it's been able to be okay, we've used this formula or other brands use this formula or this ingredient and it clumps or it, uh, it has an off taste or it makes a weird color in solution or it falls out of solution. Um, it's gotten into that aspect of how can it not just be an effective product but the experience also be mm. as, as good as you can make it and make it as non-supplement uh, feeling as possible. Meaning like, I think there's this level of expectation that when people use a supplement, let's say a pre-workout, that some of it's gonna fall out of solution, or a creatine product that some of it's gonna be gritty, or, or a protein that blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think the cool part now is I'm gaining this perspective where a lot of those things can be improved and I'm learning how they can too. And I'm applying that directly into products. So I think that's exciting because it's fun to be able to have somebody taste something and say, I didn't think a product can taste like that or that good, but also that they're getting the effects desired too. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, no, it does. So it definitely sounds like instead of looking for, new ways to make things better. It's almost like turning the gaze in um, and, and in a very retrospective sense, um, looking back to what we do know, but just trying to make that better and understanding how we can make the best with what we've got in terms of the current supplements and uh, tools available to us. No, very cool. Um, I think just just real, a real quick um, addition there is I, I, I love the aspect of being progressive but if you're being progressive just for the sake of being progressive, you can get a little bit lost and, and you can um, like you can't forget that there is an, an entire experience tied to consuming something or eating something. And um, I think pumping the brakes sometimes is important. And I think we know that in programming and nutrition intervention, too. It, it's like saying just because you want to get lean and dieting 
let's just try to lose it all in as, in as few as weeks as possible. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. No, I think that's a good analogy. And man, I'm, I'm really excited to uh, see what you guys produce uh, moving forward. But I guess now we can uh, that we've got some of the philosophical and I guess the, the more important discussion points uh, covered. I want to then discuss, you know, what supplements do work. Now, outside the cool whey, protein, casein, uh, creatine, you know, those kind of things, you know, what are some of the more interesting, uh, somewhat, you know, unconventional supplements that have been shown to work um, and some that are potentially on the horizon to be, you know, more effective and become mainstream over the coming years? Um. I think anything that's somewhat stimulant based or, or produces an effect that I, I think stimulants are the easiest because you feel the effect undeniably, um, whereas something like creatine or citrulline or a lot of amino acid based stuff is very subtle. Um, I think new delivery technologies will continue to to be game changers and things that might take ingredients that maybe weren't efficacious um, on a broad level. It, it might completely change that. For example, like stuff like resveratrol or a lot of herbal things have notoriously really bad bioavailability. Um, so if you can improve the delivery, you can totally change the effects. Uh, I think ingredients like berberine are very interesting, uh, especially for longevity. Um, ashwagandha, bacopa, those are very intriguing cognitive compounds, and not because they, not because they do something like a stimulant, but because they seem to have a very balancing effect on um, multiple neurotransmitter systems. Kind of similar to what I was saying about kratom. Um, and so I think to me, the most intriguing stuff right now is things that influence neurotransmitters because the reality of body comp stuff and I think traditional fitness supplements is that it's very, very difficult to mimic a hormonal effect, uh, with an herb or an amino acid. Um, so I think I try to pick things that I can be good at and we can produce a definite, undeniable response in. And I think with like muscle builders and stuff, that's a very hard path to go because with testosterone, if you're trying to increase that, you have to go usually... Um, Speak to your bro in, in, the, in the bathroom at the gym. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You have to go super physiological yeah. if if you want to, you know, actually have a, a notable change in body comp. And then I'm I'm very intrigued by like SARMs, uh, but those are drugs, and that's never going to change mm. um, because there aren't, to my knowledge, any naturally occurring SARMs that are going to have, you know, a true impact on body comp. So I think things like fat loss and neurotransmitter based stuff that's where the most exciting stuff will continue to develop outward um, and I think the difficulty is rather than the ingredient pool going out broadening out because of more and more legislation and restriction it's actually getting more and more kind of closed in so um, I'm not sure how many new exciting ingredients we're gonna find I think I think as time goes on what's going to be most important is the combination and the dosing of what's already out there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, there was one more thing I had, but I lost it. So let's, let's continue. <laughs> no, fantastic. And let's talk a little bit about De Novo now. So De Novo is obviously your company. You can put your hand up and say that you are biased to, you know, speak <laughs> only, uh, in the best of lights when talking about De Novo, but you know, from what I have seen, there is a reason that De Novo stands out uh, from other supplement companies, and I'm sure the listeners, having heard you discuss, uh, you know, supplements, the science of supplements, and you know your perspectives uh, on them for the last, you know, thirty odd minutes, they will see why that is the case. But 
you know, what do you believe uh, separates De Novo from other supplement companies? Um, you know, that people might not be aware of or see, uh, you know, as a consumer. I think if I was to really narrow it down to one word or phrase, it's that we care. Like, and that that infiltrates everything. I think. Um, I think that should be the one thing that maybe people got from the first half hour if they got nothing else is that like, I really care about this. Like this is um, something I'm super passionate about. It's like, I love the aspect of discovery and improvement and um, being able to try to come in at an angle that where no one else is doing stuff that, that we're doing and to stand apart and be unique. So to me, I think that is the fundamental root of of the brand, and we try to branch it out and infiltrate it into everything we do, whether it's whether it's a physical product or or something else. Um, yeah, I, I think that is what will drive you to to waste the time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Diving into papers and stuff like that, and and I do think that's the separation because the reality is you can go and you can buy multiple pre works out, pre workouts out there that have citrulline, that have you know a lot of the same ingredients, um, but there is a fine tuning that comes with caring rather than just saying oh the, the the consumer wants beta alanine and creatine creatine together and they want some caffeine in there and blah blah blah. Well, I think sometimes you need to nudge maybe the consumer base too and introduce them to something that they don't even know that they want yet. You know what I mean? Um, so to me, that's all, I think, part of the core of, of, of the brand philosophy. That's awesome, man. I respect the shit out of you guys. Uh, <laughs> and my final question, a little bit more uh, philosophical uh, and broad in nature, but you, know, you mentioned discovery and improvement, and I think they are probably the qualities uh, every fitness professional should embody. Um, we speak of coaches, you know, discovery is more so related to, you know, who they are as a coach and, you know, their their niche and the type of people that they best work with and improvement that encompasses everything that they do. Uh, so how do you develop this component as a fitness professional? Obviously, you have a new role now, but I'm sure uh, it extends across everything that you do. So do you have any tips or habits that you've uh, implemented over the years to ensure that your journey uh, within the fitness industry and a, as a human and a professional continually moves forward? Yeah, I think for me, um, I would generally say, and I think this becomes more and more relevant with fitness growing and more people having the ability to get into coaching really quick and because of platforms like Instagram blowing up and becoming really popular, um, I think you really need to take the the trust someone's giving you as an authority figure seriously. I, I don't think you can betray that, and I don't think you can um, just shrug that off because – that's a, that's a big deal. Like someone saying, I trust what you're saying um, and I'm going to follow it. I think you have to take that seriously. And there's a huge element of responsibility in that. And I think one of the things that scares the shit out of me is people, a lot of people don't seem to possess that. And they blow up and they become huge coaches. And you can watch. I think it's very easy to stand back on the industry or go to a, a meet or go to anywhere and you can see what someone's motive is in doing it and because it directs their behavior and it and it it comes out in every decision they make and, every, and everything like that and um, I'm I think that's the most important thing that I, I could express to anybody trying to get into fitness whether doing coaching whether doing formulation um, I remember the feeling when I first, before I got really into fitness coaching, I worked at a, a government uh, nutrition job called WIC. And I remember the feeling of like automatically being given authority because I have a nutrition degree. And it kind of scared the shit out of me because I was like, 
these people are going to listen to everything I say. I feel responsible for their well-being. And that only continued to happen as, you know, I started to become, I guess, more known with coaching, nutrition, and powerlifting. And that's never gone away. Like, I still feel responsible. And that drives me to need to know more and to not fuck it up because I, I don't I don't want to I, I don't want to go down that that wrong path. And I think if you're motivated largely by how much you can make and how quickly you can do it, that is going to change your behaviors. So I'm not saying it's bad to do well or to um to make money in fitness, but I do think you have to really check yourself and make sure if you're not confident in your knowledge and the advice and answers you're giving to somebody, you better do something about it. And that doesn't mean you have to go to school. That means you should find, you should have a greater network of people that you know are doing it for the right reasons and be involved with them or do, there's so many now outlets for continuing education or, or broadening your education that doesn't involve university. So again, it all comes back to personal responsibility. Because ultimately, man, if you want to stay in this business, people are going to find out if you're a fraud. You're not going to be able to escape that. And I think the more we keep seeing shitty stuff happen in fitness, like it's disappointing because a lot of authorities you see kind of crashing and burning. And again, I think it all draws back to that root thing is you got to, you got to take it seriously, like, and maybe obsessively seriously. So um, to me that I think that's, that's my biggest advice and probably single most important uh, apart from anything about supplements mm. that, that is more important than all of it. Yeah, man. I, I was sitting there for like that, that whole, uh, two, three minutes, just nodding my head. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. In, uh, in our mentorship, when I talk to, uh, our students, you know, they all sit there and in one of our first lectures, I discuss uh, how I don't actually know how much money I make or the business makes, but I know my clients' calories. I know their macros. I know, you know <laughs> their, their numbers on the bar. I know you know what kind of volume loads they're using, PBs, because that's the job. The job is to do a good job and everything yeah. else starts to follow. And if you get your priorities uh, straight, you work hard and you do the right thing, uh, not what's easy, then usually good things happen. So... I'm uh, totally in agreement with that, man. But uh, Ben, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I really appreciate your time and everything you guys are doing at DeNovo. For people who want to find out a little bit more about Ben and DeNovo, where can they find you? So uh, obviously Instagram, everybody's on Instagram. We're at DeNovo Subs on Instagram. Um, it's just my name for my personal account, at Ben Esgro on there. Uh, website is DeNovoSubs.com. Um, people can always email me if they want. Uh, it's Ben at Denovo nutrition.com. Uh, and those are probably your most surefire ways to get in touch with me. Awesome, man. And we'll link all those in the description box below. I really don't know why people ask where can they find you because it's in the description box anyway, but you know, it's, <laughs> it's a formality, man. So we've got to do it. Sure. Uh, <laughs> but thank you. Uh, and guys, make sure you check out the work that, uh, Ben and Denovo do because they are phenomenal and we wouldn't have them on the podcast otherwise. Ben, thank you, my man. Thank you very much.